I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer at Gold Derby, and I am joined today by Lily Rabe, who plays Ethel Wells on Barry Jenkins' 10-episode limited series, The Underground Railroad, which is based on Colson Whitehead's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel of the same name. Lily, when you find out that you are pretty much going to be in one episode of a 10-episode series, are you instantly terrified because you have this one chance to get this character right, or do you sprint to, <laughs> or do you sprint to this opportunity because of that challenge? Oh, gosh. I, uh, you know, I, that's such a, I've never thought about it in, in those terms. Um, but it's, it's true. I think, I think with this show, so specifically with the show, each chapter of the show, each state, uh, you know, each place that the core travels to, there's, uh, you know, we always spend so much time talking about world building in a show and tone. And in a way I felt with this show in particular, there was sort of this new world building with every chapter and with every with every part of her journey and, and each state that she enters into. So in a way it did feel, I think um, sort of collectively we would talk about this, that it felt in a way like shooting these separate movies almost um, that then were being strung together, of course, in, into this one piece. But, uh, but that's really how I felt. I felt like being in, in the chapter that I was in had its own, that I was sort of, you know, we were in our own uh, world making it. And yet, uh, yes, you're of course supporting and, and, and it's all gonna be, um, you know, threaded together by the brilliant Harry Jenkins. And you already alluded to this just now, but what were some of the conversations you and Barry, who directed all 10, 10 episodes, had while preparing for your episode, which is the third, titled North Carolina? And were you able to have rehearsals before you started shooting? You know, I was looking it up recently because I couldn't remember exactly when Barry had first reached out to me. And it was in April of 2019, he wrote me an email that I have saved in the notes on my phone because, uh, it, it meant so much to me then. It will mean so much to me for uh, forever. But he wrote me this email telling me that he was doing the project he was doing and sort of how he, he came to it. And um, of course, I was I had read the book. I loved the book. And uh, they sent me I think they I think at first I just had been sent this episode. Um, but of course, before I read it, I just wrote back. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and so that was in April of 2019. So there was, there was time uh, to, to, to spend. And of course I was able to read everything before, before starting shooting, which was, which was wonderful. And, and then we did get to rehearse and, but I had never actually met Barry until I was in Atlanta. That was the first time I met him. Um, and we, we had time to rehearse and, but there was a lot of time to, to sort of, spend together uh, remotely and and on my own leading up to, to shooting. And you already mentioned how you uh, read the source material, of course. And in yeah. the source ma material, we get some insight into Ethel's backstory, uh, some of which is not necessarily specified or spelled out uh, on the actual so show. And it's so dense that I would like to break it up into a few different questions, starting with her relationships uh, with her father, Edgar, and Jasmine. For those who aren't necessarily familiar with the source material, could you talk us through these relationships and how they end up shaping Ethel? I think, you know, she has such a complicated relationship in the book with her father. And that was something, all of the things that you're speaking to that are very true about Ethel and, uh, and her history, even though they weren't necessarily in the text of the episode that we were shooting, I felt that we were really holding them for, for both Martin and Ethel. Um, as we were shooting what we were shooting. So it was sort of in the fabric of everything. I think that her, you know, her relationship, which was very fraught uh, with her father, it, it so informs her relationship to her husband and uh, the, the, the sort of unbelievable tension between them. And there's such claustrophobia in, in the episode, in, in our chapter. Um, that house that we shot in was so incredible because it really was just how it feels watching it. The walls were so 
low and it was so dark and it was almost entirely lit by candles the most brilliant dp james laxton there was no you know you really were sort of in the dark and in this tiny space and then of course as you go up for you know for cora it's it, it the, the that space you you could it was it was what it what you see and um i think that claustrophobia that is both physically there and then in the relationship she has with her husband really stems from her her relationship with her father and the sort of repeating patterns that she has what she grew up with and now what she has with with Martin um and so it's all so incredibly fraught I I often thought of Ethel as a sort of it's like she's a rubber band that's been stretched and is just right at the point of breaking but she's sort of living in that state of um of being stretched to that to that sort of outermost point and it's it's a it's relentless really the 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 feeling of it and and how present her father is in in that house and in that regard before we get into uh, her interactions with Cora where is Ethel mentally when we first meet her so even before Cora comes into the fold maybe the parts that we don't get to see of her life where, where at which stage in her life is she at that point it's such a, a wonderful question I think you know we meet her sort of she's 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 in her place of of worship and she's going uh onto her knees and that was the first scene I shot I believe uh and it was before she even knows what's happening she is pleading for something she's pleading for help I think for oxygen for um some kind of 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 guidance because she's so trapped but she is so devout and she's so uh committed to to her religion and to her belief system that i don't think it's that she is trying to i don't think she has any um plans of of leaving or breaking out of it and yet she is begging for some kind of help and some kind of guidance because she is in this sort of desperate state uh that feels untenable that feels like it can't it can't go on and so i think she's really in a in a in a desperate place and then in comes Cora, of course, brought in by her husband, Martin, who you already mentioned before, who was also the local Underground Railroad station agent. And they hide uh, Cora in the attic alongside another Black runaway named Grace. At first, Ethel treats Cora in a pretty rude and hostile manner, but sort of changes gears when Cora becomes sick. What does Ethel see in Cora that satisfies her own desires? So very much, so very much. I think that uh, there's an there's a there's an incredible intimacy for Ethel with Cora, and I think there's actually a, a kind of obsession with her. Um, having her in that in the house, um, it so activates sort of everything that has been bubbling under the surface for Ethel and, and sort of in that tension. Um, and she, there's something, you know, she believes, so, so of course her hostility towards Cora and her volatility and her violence towards Cora is all incredibly present, but she wants her there at the same time, desperately wants her there. And when she gets sick and there is need it's, and I don't even think this is conscious choice for Ethel, but it is her way in. It is her way to take over the relationship, to take over from Martin, from her father, and to say, I'm the one. I'm the one. You were brought here for me, and I am the one who is going to be the answer. Because I think for Ethel, she believes that the God and the scripture, this is where the answers lie. She is holding those answers for Cora in her mind. And so she is the answer for Cora. And I think reciprocally, she feels that Cora has come to her as some kind of 
as some kind of answer for her um, to, you know, an indication of what she is supposed to do next. And so it's wildly intimate for her. Uh, and yeah, that was an, that was an incredible thing to, to, to play. That's, uh, that's very interesting. And also in that regard, I do think it's, it is important to underline that even though Ethel is horrified by these public killing uh, slash lynchings of Black people that we also see on the show, she isn't necessarily morally opposed to them, which uh, also, you know, ties back or ties her backstory into it and her relationship with her father, who, from what I can remember from the source material, also thinks that, the, that enslaved people are cursed. Um, and I know that for a lot of, if not all actors, the number one rule is to leave judgment at the door when you're slipping mm. into a character's shoes. You've certainly played your fair share of morally ambiguous characters throughout your <laughs> career. <laughs> but I'm curious as to whether it was difficult for you to not instantly judge Ethel, or do you not even think about that uh, part of the process anymore? Or is it not just, or is it not part of your process at all anymore? Again, such a, you know, is it in Barry's, email, I remember he said in sort of all caps, uh, I would love you to play Ethel, all caps, a most conflicted woman. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yes. So everything is in conflict. And um, certainly judgment does not uh, serve us on the day. But but of course, it, it's part of our human experience with, with these characters, with this story. But I think um, for me, Ethel's her 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 desperation and her desire to have this intimacy with this with anyone with anyone and because of her childhood and you know I think there's a there's a line in the book that says Ethel was a woman who this might be not word perfect but believed in, in, in Colson Whitehead, it, Ethel was a woman who believed that a, a slave was someone who lived in the house like family, but was not family. And that conflict right there is really sort of, to me, at the, the sort of pulse of everything that Ethel does, that this woman is here and she's like family. She is a, a possession. She is someone that she's obsessed with. There's something um, overly familiar and familial in the way that she feels about Cora. She's in love with her, actually, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah. And yet there is disgust and repulsion and uh, all of those things are, 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 they're all entangled in the way that Ethel is, is interacting with this woman and, and where, and, and how she feels about this woman. And so there's plenty to judge there. Uh, <laughs> plenty, of course, but no, I think, I think, you know, having Barry, it really was, he held everything with such, uh, with such grace and generosity and there was every fiber of, um, of every frame was held in a way that really no one else, he's really unlike anyone else. And so I think part of being able to suspend that judgment and play the part and tell the story was all because of, of Barry. And you just, you know, you, you just wanna tell, tell that story, tell his story and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and just to get into uh, the technical aspects of your performance, you have a very specific and uh, heavy dialect on the show. How challenging uh -huh. was it learning this dialect? And did you perhaps have dialect coaches on set uh, on whom you could lean if you needed spontaneous advice? I um I love dialects, and not only do I love dialects, but I love uh, I love how much I I feel that the sort of where your voice is is placed can be a way into someone. And it was interesting. I never really made a conscious choice about Ethel's voice, but I remember actually the dialect coach on set said to me after the first day, the, the placement of her, you know, she sort of acknowledged something that I don't, it wasn't really a conscious choice. I think it was just um, Ethel's that that tension sort of landed my voice in a place that is really quite different 
than my than where it normally is. Uh, the dialect aside, it was sort of a combination of the right. two. Um, and so I loved it and I, they were so intertwined. I, I, I always, um, I do have someone that I work with separately because I, I met him in the, working at the public theater and I love him. And so we love to work together. Uh, and there was someone set, but <laughs> really, and I would say, well, what about that? She was just like, oh, she was um, amazingly supportive and, and wonderful. But I love that. I love that detail work. It's, um, yeah, it's such a, a gift to, to sort of have the opportunity to do that. And you already started mentioning this uh, just now, but just putting on a dialect and being in hair and makeup, uh, does that help you get into character sometimes? Or, or, yes, or yes. are there even times where you might conversely find it hindering when you're just trying to convey and nail the essence of a character? Have you had both? Or would you say it really helps you get into character? Listen, it depends who you're working with. <laughs> but if you're working with if you're working with really brilliant uh, collaborators and and designers, and on this show, I've never worked with anyone better in every single department. Um, it was just definitely I, it was the way in. every every layer of fabric that I put on Carolyn Eslin was the costume designer. She's a genius. She was everyone was the work was so detailed and there was so, you could just sort of feel everyone's heart in every single thing uh, that they were doing. You know, the, the, the when you were getting your mic wired, it was done with just such incredible care and um, and, and respect and, and devotion to the work and to, to bury into the story. And, and you just, it was really pervasive. You felt it through, through, through every step of getting ready in the morning. And um, I mean, there was very little, <laughs> little makeup. I think it was, if anything, it was like you know, yellowing your teeth. Uh, but, but all of it was, everyone was just uh, remarkable. And yes, um, Ethel couldn't, Ethel was so tied to uh, having my hair pulled back exactly as it was and um, how incredibly uncomfortable the, the lace is in those bonnets. And, um, you know, comfort is not something that, uh, that, so I remember the shoes were sort of miserable and they were like, well, we can put pads in them or make them. And I was like, no, no, I, I want them to be as uncomfortable as they are. Well, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And uh, sort of in relation to the question I asked at the very beginning, uh, over the course of your career, you've been involved in so many projects in which uh, you played a character for either just uh, a season or for just several episodes. You were, of course, uh, in uh, eight of the past nine installments uh, of American Horror Story, sometimes as a regular, sometimes as a guest star. And even this past season, you were on another uh, limited series, HBO's The Undoing. Do you as an actor prefer to constantly switch things up or are you also looking to play a character or the same character over the course of multiple seasons, which you may or may not have the opportunity to do with your Amazon show, uh, Tell Me Your Secrets? I love the limited series format is a wonderful format. Um, I think, and also really what Ryan has been doing with Horror Story oh, yeah. for a decade now, you know, and now it's happening a lot more, but when he started doing that, it was really, not happening yeah. um and he sort of start you know was breaking the mold i i feel where for an actor you could sort of be part of this troop uh and and come and go and like you said sometimes i would come for the full season sometimes i was doing something else and i'd come in for an episode sometimes you know it was uh it's such a, a gift to be able to kind of come you know and you're with the same creators and you're with so many of the same writers and fellow actors, and yet you get to come in as this new person into this new world uh, each season. And that really is something that I love. And I do find the limited series format sort of, it's, it's really divine because you get to tell a story for eight hours or 10 hours. Um, and it's like getting to do you know a long movie. Sometimes when you're doing a movie, you think, I just wish we had more time. I wish we had more time. I love doing movies too, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It is a really, really wonderful format. I do think in terms of playing the same part um, ongoing, I don't know that I could do it for 22 episodes. <laughs> I'm in awe of, of, of that. I've never done it. I think the most, maybe it was 12 episodes one season mm -hmm. or, but um, 
but the idea of because you do there are some some characters that I've played who that I've really really missed yeah and it is wonderful to to miss to miss them but sometimes I do wish <laughs> to had more yeah. time so I think it, it really would come down to the role and also whoever was was uh leading the leading the the charge because that really is when when you make that commitment to to sort of tell a story ongoing it really just it matters whose vision you're going to be uh supporting right and on a final note i do have to bring up american horror story one more time since you will be part of the upcoming uh, 10th installment which yeah. is titled D double feature and in which you will be playing a character named uh, doris gardner i know you can't go into the, any details but <laughs> what can we expect from you as an actor in this and what do you think will surprise viewers most about this season i can say that this is one of my favorite seasons that i've that i've done on horror story i had such a wonderful time with Doris, um, now I can say her name, <laughs> and uh, it, it, she really is nothing like any of any of the characters that I've played on Horror Story. And the world is 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 completely different too. And I think I think fans who've loved the show will will love it. And I also think for people who haven't seen the show. Um, and discover it on the 10th season will have a really uh, a wonderful experience. I, I, um, I think what, what this season is, is about is incredibly compelling. Well, we're certainly looking forward. And thank you so much, Lily, for joining us today. To our <laughs> viewers, thank you. thank you. And to our viewers, make sure to go to goldderby.com to make your predictions. And before you go, click subscribe to watch all of our great content with top contenders. Thank you so much. Thank you.